say a couple brief statements. I want to get right into the word tonight. Um, just want to say, real carefully, everybody looking at me up here. The devil does not want you in the service tonight. Um, what we're about to talk about, something many churches never talk about, something that people do not ever get into. But true freedom is going to break out in this place over many areas of your life. When uh, there are two major things that the Bible uh, talks about, there are a few things. Obviously, the blood of the lamb is incredible. It's our weapon against Satan, the word of God. But there's a couple things that the Bible says that the enemy and people will know that we belong to the Lord from. Number one is because of our love. He says, you will recognize and know them that you are mine by your love. And then number two, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that we are unusual on the earth because we prosper when everyone else is not. That we are not subject to the economies. We're not subject to the attitudes. We're not subject to the things that are going on. And because of that, Christians stand out. It's one of the main reasons we've all heard it. You know, you're in the world, but you're not of it. In the context of what that means, it comes from the statement of, I will make you shine and your light will shine when everybody else's goes dark. When everybody else is depressed, you will not be. When everybody else is in pain, you're not going to be. When everybody else is worried and anxious, you're not going to be. That's what it's supposed to be like to be a Christian. So tonight and this entire month, living the abundant life is a wrecking ball toward hell in your life. I just want you to know that this is a very, very dangerous subject for you to enter into because it's dangerous for the kingdom of hell when you begin to realize the kind of life that God has wanted you to live. So are you ready to find that out tonight? All right, go ahead and take a seat tonight. Thank you so much, worship team. I want to tell you right from the get-go, I am on the hunt tonight. Let me explain to you what I mean. You know, Pastor Marco and I, and my father on the 20th, that's going to be exciting, um, are tag-teaming during this trying to feed you the principles that produce power and results in your life. However, Pastor Marco is anointed for a certain type of thing. My father, when he comes, he's going to have a totally different kind of anointing. Myself, I'm anointed for what I'm anointed for. And my role to play mostly in this series is to attack spirits. Pastor Marco's given us incredible principles. He's showing us the way to prosper. He's literally giving you the step-by-step -step of what success means. Business conferences use these same principles for people who gain millions of dollars. and The world uses these principles and they succeed. People pay thousands of dollars to hear some of the things that you're going to hear this month. But I'm here to attack a spirit. Some of you have no idea what this spirit is. You have no idea that you've actually been living under this. Not everyone in this building is under this. But some of you have been living under this for more years than even you've been alive. Because it's been in your family. It was for your mom and your dad. They had it. They were living under it. Your grandparents had it. They were living under it. Your great-great-grandparents had it. And possibly some of you, hundreds of years will go back and this spirit began back then. I'm talking to you tonight about breaking the poverty curse. So if my tone, if the way I'm talking, if the way I'm looking, I'm just going to let you know it's a little different tonight because I feel fired up because I'm on the hunt for something. I, I, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm going to move around this building tonight. This stage cannot hold me tonight, so I might come out there with you, so just don't get nervous. I'm not going to come ask you some questions or something. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I need to get up in some of y'all's faces because I'm confronting something tonight. Because I need you to join with me in faith and confront it over yourself. Let me tell you something. You can hear all the sermons in the world and you can think the preachers are doing great and saying amen. But please understand that the greatest preacher in the world will always be you. The greatest evangelist, the greatest prophet, the greatest pastors 
They can do what they can do and they play their part, which is very important. However, they cannot go home with you and be with you 24-7. Yet you wake up with yourself 24-7. They're not looking at you in the mirror every single time you look at yourself, but you're looking at yourself every single time. They're not knowing all the things you're doing that you're ashamed of, but you know those things. They're not knowing the feeling that you have when you feel you're missing out and you're behind and, and God must have missed you and you've missed it and you're ashamed and you're feeling like you're doing nothing for God. They don't know those feelings, but you're feeling it completely. That's why God gave you a mouth. And the Bible says your mouth is redeemed because your mouth, God said, I give you my mouth and I give you my mind. You have the mind of Christ and you have the mouth. That mouth, the same mouth that created things out of nothing, created stars, created water, created earth, created wind, created animals. That same mouth, he says, now I give you the ability of life and death and I put it inside of your mouth. The same mouth that can create nothing, something out of nothing, he says, I give it to you. David was in a place where he woke up one day and he said, Psalm 42, why am I feeling so depressed? You remember that? He wakes up and he does not know why he's feeling downcast. He doesn't know why he's feeling sad. Some of you might have this feeling. You wake up and you don't want to get out of bed. You don't necessarily know why, but you don't necessarily want to go on either. You'd rather just stay in bed, watch some Netflix, turn on Hallmark for a while, get a warm little cup of tea, and not face the day that you're in. Has anybody ever felt that before? Who's honest? Okay. Paul, I mean, David's feeling that one day. He wakes up and he says, I don't know what's going on. But the difference between David and many of us was he did not allow that to continue. He looked at his own self and began preaching to himself. Because the world's greatest preacher is not the prophet, it is not the pastor, the world's greatest preacher is you. You sometimes have to wake up and look at your own soul and say, soul, I understand you're sad right now, but we're not going to stay that way. Emotions, I understand I'm depressed right now, but it's not what God wants for me, so I'm not going to stay that way. Sometimes you have to speak to your own soul and tell it to shut up and the Spirit of God to rise up out of you. Let me tell you this, as long as your mouth stays silent, your soul gets louder. I need you to agree with me tonight. I'm, I'm trying to reach out for faith in you tonight. I'm, I'm trying to reach down past your ears, past your heart, and down into the depths of your spirit to wake up faith for some of you that might have been dead for years. Because until you agree with your own mouth, nothing is going to change. Until you confront your own problems, nothing is going to change. Until you take responsibility and accountability and say, you know what, I have made some mistakes. Nothing is going to change. Until you stop blaming a leadership. Until you stop blaming God. Until you stop blaming anybody else. Your mom, your dad, the place where you were raised. Nothing is going to change. I'm on a hunt tonight. Because this spirit has been robbing from you and it makes me sick. I'm tired of the devil taking things from people that I love. I'm tired of the enemy convincing you that you are less than you are. But I can't do it for you. I'm going to tell you about it tonight. But you're going to have to maybe pause for a moment when you get out of the service. You're going to have to go home and you're going to have to look into the mirror and you're going to have to speak to yourself and you're going to decide whether you believe everything I say tonight or whether it was just another sermon. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God will speak to many of you tonight and you will have a seed that is planted in you and something is about to burst forth where actual change is about to take place in your life. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Are you ready? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many thank God for that grace? Though he was rich. Listen to every word I say tonight. Please focus. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that by his poverty, 
he could make you rich. Let me read that in the Amplified, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich or abundantly blessed. You see, 2,000 years ago, y'all, there was a cross. And this cross was lifted by a man. And this man was perfect and didn't deserve it. But on that day that he hung on this cross, he connected the top of it which was connecting to heaven and the bottom of it which was connecting to earth. And the only way the passage of from earth to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And he connected us by this emblem, two sticks, two poles, two parts of a tree going this way and this way were powerful enough to recalibrate your future and take it back from the hands of an enemy who stole it from you before you were even born. But he decided that on that day, he would become many things. The Bible talks about exchanges. He became sick so you could become healed. He became, what happened? He became, took the curse of guilt so that you don't have to have guilt. He took all of shame so now you can be forgiven. But one of the things that he also did was he became poverty itself. He became poor so that you would not have to be poor in any area of your life. Let me describe what poverty is. The Bible does it very well in Deuteronomy 28, 48. This is the poverty curse defined in one of the greatest ways in the Bible. You will serve your enemies. This is in Deuteronomy 28. This is a result of if they did not obey the Lord God, these things would happen. Poverty would come upon him. You will serve your enemies who the Lord will send against you. Listen to these words. You will be left, number one, hungry. Number two, thirsty. Number three, naked. Number four, and lacking in everything. Think about what Jesus did. When Jesus went to the cross, he had not eaten for 24 hours. He was hungry. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, I thirst. He was thirsty. Jesus went to the cross naked. They took his clothes from him. Jesus went to the cross and he lacked everything. He had nothing at the moment he went to the cross. He even had to be in a borrowed man's tomb. In other words, Jesus went and became the fullness of everything that poverty could offer. So that you and I today could not settle with ourselves to be poor and lack in any area of our life. Understand what I am saying. And I got to get off the stage real quick and I got to talk to you because you got to understand what I just said. Some of you need to listen to this. I understand that you have tried and you feel you have failed again and again and again. And if we were to look at your life in that area, your own strength is lacking. But I still have to tell you, there is a cross that is arguing with your circumstance. And it is saying in your face, he took the poverty so you don't have to. I understand that your family is still not saved. And you've prayed and you prayed. And if you would look at the areas of your life, there would be lack there. But there's a cross that is shouting something to you that he took the poverty so you wouldn't have to stay poor in this. I understand that you have not been able to pay your rent. I get it that things have happened. I get it how you felt poor before I understand what it's like to go without but please understand you do not have to stay that way if you would just know that the cross of Jesus Christ has taken all areas of poverty so you do not have to I'm trying to tell you that not everything's gonna change just cuz I'm saying this I'm not expecting it. I'm just trying to get you in faith can you believe that God 2,000 years ago took all of the poverty and so there still might be a chance that you could still get blessed 
Can there still be a chance? Some of you don't know this yet. You got to let this arise in your spirit. I'm trying to tell you. I get it. You, it hasn't worked. I've tried to be healed before. I've been prayed before. But I just want you to know the cross is still shouting your direction. 2,000 years ago, he shouted it on that day. And he said, I became poverty. So you do not have to stay poor. Please understand something. The cross is the shifter for all of your circumstances. We do not look at our circumstances and impose our circumstances on the Bible. We allow the Bible to change our circumstances. We do not go through our circumstances and see the failures and the things that have gone wrong and expect and then read through the cross and say, well, I guess it's not for me because it didn't work. We allow what the cross did to sink into our hearts and it begins to work. But you got to work it. Let me say it like this. Let me, let me try to explain this. Just because Jesus with the cross became all your poverty. Just because he became the extent of the fullness of whatever poverty could be. Which let's say it's lack. He became the fullest extent of what it means to lack. It doesn't mean... That just because he put you on the highest place now, he said he translated you out of darkness. And he brought you into his highest kingdom. Just because you have been translated out of darkness and positionally he put you in the highest place does not mean you will feel like it. Does not mean that you have to live in the light. Does not mean that you have to have that. Just because, it's like having a bank vault. It's like having a bank vault. And the vault literally is there. And God has now given you an inheritance. You have no idea how much is behind that vault door. It's unbelievable the things he's given you. The Bible says he gave you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Like it belongs to you now. Not tomorrow. Not five years. Like now it belongs to you. Okay, he gave it to you. But it does not mean you are going to have any of it in your lifetime. There are things that are in this vault. There are breakthroughs for your family that are in this vault. There are things that God has paid for. There are body parts that literally God has paid for for your sickness. There are mindsets that God has already paid for because he became every lack that you could ever have. Before you even were born, he took care of it on the cross. He provided for it on the cross. But you don't have to open up that door. Christians do it every single day all over America. They have everything given to them positionally, but they experience nothing. So they are now lost people with the title of a Christian. You'll still depress like when you were lost. You still have suicidal thoughts like when you were lost. You still are having nightmares like crazy like when you were lost. You still can't control any of your temptations like when you were lost. You don't have any more power over it. But you said a prayer. You came up to an altar. Positionally on that day when you prayed, everything shifted for you as far as heaven's concerned. But it does not mean that you're experiencing it because God waits for you to agree with what he says and actually believe that what he gave you is actually yours. And until you do that, you will not act like it's yours, which means you will not experience any of it. Some people in this building are still under a curse. Curse, Gavin, what are you talking about? That's an intense word. It's a Bible word. And the reason why I'm talking about it tonight is please understand. I'm only talking about it because you don't belong there. Because God already became all of poverty so you wouldn't have to. Let's read what Galatians says real quick. Galatians 3, this is so powerful. Galatians 3, 13 through 14, but Christ has rescued us, look at this, from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, that's you and me, 
with the same blessings he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. So what is he saying? He's saying, I became the curse. So why are you still sitting under one? I'm not talking about having 50 mansions. I'm saying you don't need to be under any lack in your life. I'm saying Jesus paid the price. I'm just trying to start you somewhere. Because for some of y'all, this mindset of being poor has gotten so deep inside of you, you don't even know what it would look like for you not to be. Some of you have no idea. You can't even see yourself succeeding. You literally have failed for so long, you don't even know what it would feel like to be a success. You literally have no idea. You couldn't even describe it. I've had people walk up to me after preaching this message and they say, Gavin, literally, I, I don't even know what it's going to look like for me to succeed in anything. I failed all my life in everything I've done. It's because they're under a curse. But tonight, curses are snapping all over this building. Tonight, curses are breaking all over this building. Let me tell you what a curse is. Now, let's get into this, okay? This is how it is. Curses and blessings. Listen very carefully now. I'm going to teach you. Curses and blessings of spiritual power for good or for bad. They're usually carried on words, declarations that people have said. It might not have been to you. It could have been back in your generational line. Or objects. For instance, Isaac is a great example. Isaac wants to have a blessing. He wants to bless his son Esau. We know the story. Jacob comes in, puts on the clothes of Esau, fakes him out. Isaac can't see very well. So he's in that place. And something comes over Isaac, though. It's not a normal moment. It's a moment where declaration rises out of you, a supernatural time, where then God uses your mouth to agree with what he's already said in heaven for something supernatural to collide in your atmosphere. It comes out of your mouth. It already came out of the mouth of God. So what's happening is Isaac's in this place. He feels him and he says, I, you feel like my son Esau. Come a little closer. You smell like my son Esau. So he blesses him. Do you remember this? He gives him the blessing. It's a divine moment and he gives it to him. Esau comes in later and says, hey, uh, I'm ready for the blessing. He goes, oh my gosh. He goes, there's no way. He said, who was in here before? He said, I don't know. He said, I already gave your blessing to your brother. He said, what are you talking about? Don't you have more than one blessing? What is going on here? There's a divine moment that it happens. You can't just manufacture this. There's a moment where spiritually something will happen, and it's going to happen to some of y'all tonight, where something is going to rise up inside of you, a moment of faith that God can actually work with. And in that moment, the faith is going to arise. You're going to say it out of your mouth, and God's going to use that moment to agree with himself, and something is going to break and spark in the atmosphere of your life. Blessings, they're special moments. They're actually declarations of words. Uh, they also go on objects. For instance, um, curses can also come on objects as well, as well as blessings. But for instance, for the curse, the Old Testament, it says that when women uh, were with the camp of the Israelites, when they would be accused of committing adultery, it said that they would have to come to the priest and the priest would write down because the husband was there and saying she slept with him, you know, she committed adultery and the priest doesn't know whether it happened or not. So what he would do is he would write a curse on a piece of paper. He would then rinse off the curse and the ink would come into the water of that curse. The ink would come into the water. She would drink that water, and if it was not true that she committed adultery, it would not touch her. Nothing would happen. But if it was true and she was guilty in any way, she would be barren for the rest of her life. It was an object. Literally came on. Christ became every curse so that you could look at the curse and say, it's time for you to vacate the premises in my life. Now, please understand this. I'm trying to tell you once again, remember the vault. Just because Jesus broke all the curses. You know how curses thrive? On your ignorance. When you don't know they exist. When you think, you know what? Church, you know, Jesus did everything for me. I'm all good. When you're one of those people like, I don't got a part to play. God will just do it for me. You know, if I need to be healed, I'm sure he'll get me healed if he wants me to be. You know, if I need to succeed, I'm sure he'll open the door. He'll just do it. I ain't got to change nothing about my own life. I don't have to have any role to play. Jesus did everything. No, no, no. Jesus is not a sugar daddy. 
He needs you to do your part and you can actually access what he put in that bank vault for you and for your family. Okay. Curses have characteristics, listen carefully, of continuing on through generation to generation until it is broken by an individual who recognizes it, traces it to its source, and cuts it off in the name of Jesus. It literally, some of you who are sitting in this building are experiencing the consequences of something that you had nothing to do with generations before you. You're still experiencing. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Curses are like, um, they're invisible barriers. If you want to think of what a curse is, it's an invisible barrier between you and the blessing. It's, it's like they're the hands of the past that are constantly getting involved in your present in order to trip you up so you can't attain your future. Let me say that again. Curses are like invisible barriers between you and the blessing. You seem to almost get there, but the moment you're about to truly attain the life God wants for you, the moment you're about to attain that success, that breakthrough finally, the moment you're about to start experiencing the abundant life, it's like there's an invisible hand from the past that comes and trips you up and you're not able to fully experience it. Deuteronomy 28 there's so many incredible things. There are 14 verses of blessings in it, and there are 54 verses of curses. But let me tell you the main areas that the blessings invade in your life, summed up from that entire chapter. The main blessings, when they invade your life, they invade these areas. Listen to some of these blessings that should be happening in your life right now. Number one, you're going to be lifted high in influence, not just in your own home, but you'll have nationwide influence. Being lifted up high, that's one of the areas that blessing comes. It blesses your influence. Number two, reproductiveness. In other words, every area of your life becomes fruitful. Number three, your health. Your actual physical health is blessed. Sickness might come and it can maybe visit you, but it never stays. Number four, you have success in all the things you put your hand to. How amazing would that be? Psalm 1 says, everything you do, it said, whatsoever you doeth shall prosper. In other words, you can't say whatsoever you sit back and watch will prosper. It says whatsoever you get involved in in faith and you do, I'm going to bless your doing. I'm not going to bless your watching. I'm going to bless your doing. Look at this, number five. Victory over all the works of the devil. You are not ever defeated. Oh my God. Number six, you're the head and you're not the tail. Let me just tell you, tell you how to just see that easily. The head makes the decisions, but the tail just gets dragged around. How have you felt in your life? Are you over the circumstances? Or are you being dragged through your circumstances constantly? Number seven, you're above and you're never beneath. Now, watch the same areas in the opposite affected by curses. Number one, constant humiliation. Number two, barrenness. Physically and in everything that you touch, you will not produce. You just don't get fruit when you go for something. Number three, constant sicknesses. Chronic sicknesses keep touching your family over and over. It's happened to your mom and then your grandfather. And if you look back, especially hereditary sicknesses. Four, poverty and failure. You're constantly been poor. You don't remember a time you weren't poor. And you always fail at what you put your hand to do. It's very rare if you ever succeed. Number five, constant defeat. Number six, you're the tail and not the head. And number seven, you're beneath and you're not above. I remember a person, a, a Christian, he was joking and he, he said, how are you doing, man? He was asking another guy. And the guy's like, well, you know, under the circumstances, you know, I think I'm doing pretty well. He's like, what are you doing under the circumstances? You're not supposed to be under them. You're above, not beneath, right? Okay, let me go through the, These are some indications. There are many in the Bible, but these are some indications to see if maybe you're still under a curse. Doesn't mean Jesus didn't pay for you to get out, but until you recognize that some of you have to declare and break this tonight. Now, it doesn't, now if I read one of these, it does not mean just by having one of these you're under a curse, but the more that you can identify it, the more likely it is. 
Number one, frequent mental or emotional breakdowns. Number two, chronic or frequent sicknesses, especially hereditary. Number three, barrenness for women or tendencies to miscarry. Number four, constant divorces or family breakups. It runs through your family line. Divorce and family breakup. Number five, constant financial insufficiency. You don't remember when people, anyone in your family line, were sufficient. You've just always been poor. You always struggle. Paycheck to paycheck. It's been your entire life. Number six, you're accident prone. There are some people, it literally is unnatural how much they can get hurt. And, it's, and, and honestly, it, it, you can laugh, but it's not funny. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's not natural that you're always the one, when you step off of the curb, you always twist your ankle. It's not, it's not okay that, you know, you're always whatever car you get breaks down the moment you touch it. You always have the car problem. You always have the issues of all these things. It's one thing, things happen in life, but I'm talking, sometimes, it's literally all the time. If you are constantly feeling like you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's an issue you need to think about. It may be beyond you. Number seven, you seem to always be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Number eight, you have a strong history of suicides in your family or unnatural deaths. This is real. This is in the body of Christ today. Watch what Proverbs 26 2 says. This is so incredible. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse will not land on its intended victims. In other words, if there's no reason for it, that witch doctor can look at you in the face and curse you all they want, but it will die and fall to the ground. If there's no reason for it, people can curse you, people can talk about you, but you don't even notice all the haters because you're so succumbed in the blood of Jesus. You're in the blessing and abundance that the abundance and the blessing, listen to this, the blessing fights off all the curses. You don't even have to. There is a moment when the blessing fights off the curses. You don't even have to. But if there is the signs of a curse, it's because there's a reason. The Bible says no curse that has no reason will ever touch you. But there's a cause if it's there. Abraham is an example. When God uh, gave the blessings of Abraham, it was a sevenfold blessing. We're entitled to the same blessing. And God came to him and gave him a sevenfold blessing. One of those, the number six blessing that he gave him was this. I will curse anyone who curses you, Abraham. I will literally curse anyone who tries to curse you. I'll curse them instead of you getting the curse. You see, God puts an incredible protection clause within his own blessings. Because once you have surrendered, listen, once you have surrendered, a man or a woman surrenders fully to God to be used for special purposes. The devil is right away has a, a red dot on your head. You become a target for the enemy like never before once you learn how to surrender. But God himself within the blessing has already put a protection clause. Where he says, anyone who tries to curse you, anyone who tries to trip you up, you're mine now, you're dedicated to me, I will make sure that they get double whatever they try to curse you with. Unbelievable. Okay, here's the main cause for biblical blessing. Are you ready for this? To get biblical blessing and biblical curses. Here's the main cause from the Bible. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2. Listen to these words. This is the main way. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all of his commands I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. You'll experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. The number one way to constantly have the blessings of God as your life is to simply hear his voice and say yes. See his principle and apply it. That's the number one. You want to know the number one way of curses? Watch this. Deuteronomy 28.1. Uh, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 28.15. If you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all these commands I'm giving today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. 
So the number one way to be blessed is to listen and obey. The number one way to put yourself under a curse, not because God wants it on you, because he paid for it to come off of you. The number one way to put yourself under is to listen and say, nope. Look at what Deuteronomy 28 one says. It says, it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord. That word diligent means this. It means when he speaks, three things. You give him your attention. You begin to declare it with your own mouth, and then you obey it. Give him your attention. Begin to declare it with your own mouth once you hear him speak. Agree with what he said. Say it out of your own mouth, and then begin to obey it. In other words, some of y'all are not moving in your life yet because you have not found something to obey. I'm going to say that again. Some of y'all are still parked where you are in your life. Nothing's changing. Success isn't coming, even though you're coming to church, because you have not found something to personally obey. Because when you find something to obey and to declare, you begin to shatter the barriers between you and blessing. Watch this. Jesus comes up to the fig tree. This is an incredible moment. And he walks over to the fig tree and it says, and all the disciples are with him. And he comes and he sees that there is no figs. However, it wasn't the season for figs. So why is Jesus getting so upset? Because we know what he does. He curses the tree. And the next day they come and the tree is all shriveled up. Peter says, oh my gosh, it died. And Jesus is there and he goes, why is Jesus cursing this tree? In other words, poor tree, right? I mean, the tree wasn't even supposed to have figs. So why is he cursing it? But it's because Jesus is unlike any other man. When Jesus comes on into your season, it becomes your season, whether the season was supposed to be or not. Do you hear what I just said? I said, when Jesus comes and steps into your season, it becomes your season. So when he looked at the tree and it did not produce, because watch this, the presence of Jesus demands fruitfulness. The presence of Jesus demands from your life fruitfulness. And many of us are sitting in church on Sundays and Wednesdays and we look like we got figs. We got the hands lifted. We got the worship songs going. We're on our knees. We're coming here. But in our lives, we are in rebellion and resistance to what he's telling us every day. He's coming. He's like, oh man, this looks like fruit. He turns over the leaf and he looks inside your heart. There's nothing there. For me to partake of. There's so many other ways that the Bible talks about curses coming upon and blessings. But we're about to confront this head on in just a moment. But before we do, the last thing I want to say is this. There is this thing in contracts. When you sign a contract for anything, there's a small thing called a clause. And you better read those clauses, right? Because all of the contract you could agree with. But if there's a clause in there, this little clause, it can totally override the entire contract. Because of this tiny little clause that you might have missed. Well, the Bible has this thing called the if clause. If you will obey the Lord your God, then I will keep you in perfect health. If you will hearken to the Lord, if you will forgive your neighbor, I will release you from the chains of offense and being controlled in your life. If you will take care and steward your body, I will make sure you live for the fullness of your days. No sickness will take you out. Nobody be able to do it because you obeyed the if, you get the results of the blessing. There is an if clause. In other words, there's a part that you have to play. Abraham, when God told him, I want you to go to a new city, what did he do? He had to do his part. He had to pack up all of his stuff, even though he didn't know anything about the land he was going to. And he had to give Jesus his feet. He had to begin to walk. He did his part. God gave him a whole new future. When David was sitting there in the sheep, in the pasture, what did he do? He did his part. He got that sling and he began to practice. And then God let a bear come so he could slay a bear and see what he was worth. And then he let a lion come. And he got a lion and he actually beat it with a club in the face. What a dude. 
God let him do all that. He let him get some practice in. He was doing his part. He was practicing because David didn't know it, but his biggest promotion, which was in the form of a giant called Goliath, was about to come around the corner. So David does his part. He takes the sling from what he practiced because he was doing his part when nobody else was watching. He was winning private victories. Listen, he was winning private victories. There are victories that you can do right now and be winning in private that none of us are seeing that when the moment comes for you to be promoted, God will not have to resist you. He can say, let that rock loose. Let that gift loose. Let it go. It's your time. It's your time to step up now for your family. It's your time to do this. I'm going to release you now. And what did he do? He released a stone. Do you know that stone had to be traveling over 220 miles an hour? Why? Because it didn't just go through the skull of Goliath. It went through two inches of steel and the skull of Goliath. He did his part and God made it hit the mark. Lay your hands on the sick, the Bible says, and they shall recover. Laying your hands is your part. You better do that part because God's not going to do that part for you. But they shall recover. That's God's part. You have a part to play. Do you know what the part is you're supposed to be playing right now in your life? You know, a lot of people think Jesus was poor. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, put it up one more time. Bible says, though he was rich, he became poor. When's the moment that Jesus became poor? Only the moment he went to the cross. Let me say it to you like this, a couple statements. Any man who, when he's born, is given over $2.2 million of gifts at the moment of his birth is not growing up poor. Let me say this again. Any man and I'm just talking money now, who walks around with his own bank is not poor. No, Jesus did not flaunt his wealth, but he wasn't needing for anything. Any man who in tax collectors can come up to him and say, you should be paying your taxes, can say, oh, taxes? Uh, okay, hey, Peter, just go over there. You don't, even put, you don't even need to put bait on this hook. Just go take a hook right over there and just catch the first fish you see. That fish is going to have our coin. Go ahead and go get it. He goes, gets it, gets the coin, flips it to him. Okay, you good now? All right, let me walk on. That man is not poor. Let's talk that finance. Let's talk resources. Any man by the time he's 12 years old that has revelation in order to be teaching all of the greatest scribes is not poor. Any man, Jesus said, who walked around, the Bible said, with many prominent women and prominent men constantly around him. If you got rich friends, you ain't poor. Any man, are you listening to me? who can go and have five loaves and two fish and feed over 12,000 people within a moment is not poor. He had access to every resource at any moment. That is called wealth. You see, if you look here, there's insufficiency, which is lack. There's sufficiency, and then there's abundance. Insufficiency means if I need $10 and I get $9.95, I'm insufficient. I have not met it. Sufficiency means I have exactly $10 at the moment I need $10. Let's think of it this way. You need peace right now, but you've been lacking. You're insufficient. You need the peace, but you don't have the goods. You have words of wisdom that you need. You walk up to that person and you would love it if words of wisdom could come out of your mouth and God could use you. But you haven't been plugged in because you're in lack. So you're not coming up. You can't give the words of wisdom. You send them to the pastor or you send them to somebody else who's really a good Christian because you're in lack. Sufficiency means the moment that you need it, it's there. The moment you need wisdom, it's there. The moment you need healing power, it's there. The moment you need the word of prophecy, it's there. The moment you need wisdom on your job for your business, when to do this, when to come out of the deal, when you get in the deal, it's there. You have every single thing you need for my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Do you understand he doesn't supply it according to your riches and glory? He supplies it according to his bank account, not yours. Thank God. It's everything you need. If you'll seek first my kingdom, then all of these things are going to be added to you. You are going to be sufficient. When you need it, you're going to have it to get the job done. And we haven't even talked about abundance. Whew. Come back on Sunday. 
because I'm going to show you what abundance is from the Bible. You know why it's important to know what abundance is? Because some of y'all are really scared of this subject. You honestly are. When anybody says prosperity, you cringe inside, right? Because it's been misused, right? Because maybe you've heard before, man, uh, oh man, they're going to be talking about how many houses they got and how many cars are going in and all that. I'm just nervous about this whole thing. Listen, I'm going to show you from the Bible what God defines abundance as for every single Christian. Every one of you, so you'll know what to have faith for and what to expect. But let me tell you, none of it involves lack. God gets no glory from you not producing fruit. John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If he's in the vine, right? He comes and he prunes it so that it can produce more fruit. In other words, God loves it when you're fruitful. He gets glory from your fruit. Are you ready to confront this curse? If you have any of you right now, and this is not for everybody, but any of you right now who say, Gavin, when you were talking about these things, there's something that's stirring in my heart. I'm recognizing something, that, something that's been going on. I don't know all that's happened in my family and what has been happening, but I've been feeling those invisible hands. I've been feeling that stumbling up. I cannot get there. I've, I've even been doing some of these principles. I feel like I've been doing things, but it feels like there's this, this overshadowing feeling like I cannot get. If that's you, I want you to stand up on your feet right now. You say, I want to confront this this moment. Look at all these people right now. Look at all these people right now. Jesus became the curse. He became it so that you and I could walk free. We're about to break this curse. Close your eyes right now. The Holy Spirit is already beginning to move. I can literally feel him just right here. Like on the left side, I can literally feel him right here. Whatever area of lack in your life, it's time to confront it doesn't mean you have to memorize all the scriptures it doesn't even mean you have to know all the answers yet it just means you have to recognize it you have to know there's something going on sometimes it honestly is beyond you I want you to know I'm not talking to lazy people right now I'm not talking to people who haven't even been trying I'm not talking to them they, they it's obvious what's going on in their life if you don't work you don't eat the Bible says if you're not even trying if you're not even trying to get with God I'm talking to people who are standing right now who literally you know man man, I've been trying like I've been going but there's something that's there's been divorce Gavin in my family since I can remember of all the generations Gavin there's suicides that are through there's uncommon I've always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time what is going on I have not been able to live the abundant life number one we recognize it we're honest and we repent of our part. So right now, whatever area it was, whatever thing we were talking about, right now between you and God, you've recognized what it is, and I want you to repent for your part you've played in it. Right now between you and God. Repent for your part you have played in it. Now here's the thing. Some of y'all might be like, man, this isn't me. This isn't my, my part. Like, I don't know what's going on. Well, the Bible says you can actually confess the sins of your relatives that are actually dead as well. So you nearly right now, I need you to say, I repent, God, for all of my things that I've done to contribute to this. But I also repent, God, on behalf of my family line. On behalf of my mama and my daddy who did not repent, I repent. On behalf of the grandparents who didn't, I repent. I break off these things that have been my family line. Come on, some of you right now need to really go there with God right now. I need to, you need to attack this. God, I repent. I renounce the things that have been happening. I renounce the bounds. I don't know when it happened, God. It might have happened 100 years ago. It might have happened 20 years ago. But this is stopping now God and I am taking accountability and I repent I recognize and I repent thank you Lord God all over this building it's happening right now I can feel I can feel entanglements coming off some of your lives are never going to be the same I'm telling you I know testimonies from this that are gonna blow your mind you are gonna sense a new freedom to your life success is gonna come to you but number two here we go number one we recognize and we repent for our part number two We have to break the curse with the confession of our mouth. It's very important. You have to break it with the confession of your mouth. So repeat after me. This is a serious prayer. Nobody looking anywhere else. Focus. 
Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Come on. Dear Lord Jesus. I come to you. Who paid the price. You became the curse. So that I would not have to be under any of them. I renounce my part. My sin. And I say, you are good enough. You are more than sufficient for what I need. Lord, I reach into my family line. I reach into my family heritage. And I break the bonds of bondage. I break the curse off of my life. I come against it. I renounce it. I say leave. Take your hand off of me. I break you from my life. I break you from my children. You will not touch my children. You will not touch my grandchildren. And I receive your work that you did on the cross in Jesus mighty name. Come on, everybody clap right now. Right now. Right now. Come on. Something's breaking right now. Something that you see it. You've seen it. Now you broke it. You've seen it. Now you broke it. Now watch this. Listen. Everybody pay attention. Wow. There's deliverance that is happening right now that's in this room. It's just because of what just happened. The moment you break a curse, it, it's a big deal. Okay, here's the last thing though. It's not over yet because there's a third step. Do you want to know what that is? Whatever the area was that you know, whether it be your health, whether it be your finances, whether it be constant, uh, yeah, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, whether it be unreasonable accident proneness, whatever it is, you need to find a principle in the Bible, watch, and replace it from what you were doing, replace it with obedience to that principle, and I promise you will come out. So number one, you had to recognize it and repent. Number two, you just renounce it. But number three, you have to find something to obey. All of you need to go home tonight. Whatever area it was, you need to open up the Bible. You need to find the scripture. You need to find the statement. You need to get the promise. You need to get it inside of yourself. And then you need to dedicate no matter what happens that you are going to obey it and follow through. If it's financial, find some financial promises. If it's health, find those. If you do this... Amen? Yeah. Obey the if, you get the results. Guys, I know something's about to happen in this place. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Now, this is the last thing we're going to do. Take your seat. Pastor Marco's about to come back. Take your seat. Close your eyes. This is it. This is the end of the service. Close your eyes. Man, something powerful is happening in this room. Some of you will recognize this and didn't even know it. You didn't even know that this was over, but it's ending tonight. Woo! My God, man, there's been chronic sickness in this woman's life and her entire family. She's getting delivered. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is a great curse that you get to break. It's called death. It's not just death of actual natural dying. That word death means life away from God. Every single one of us right here will live and have eternal life. Every single one of us. You just might have it in hell or you might have it in heaven. But all of you are going to live forever. Everyone under the sound of my voice, you will live forever. It just might be in hell or it might be in heaven. But the cross has given you a way. Jesus has given you a way to escape the clutches of Satan, to escape hell, to escape death, and have a life fully with him. If you're under the sound of my voice right now and you say, Gavin, I want to receive Jesus. I want to come to the cross tonight. I want to cling to God. I want to cling to the Lord. I want to give him my life. I'm done with my own way. And you say that for the first time or you say, I want to recommit tonight. I have not been serious about God. I've not been serious about my relationship with him. I'm ready to recommit. If that's you, either one, one, two, three, put up your hands right now. All of this building. Put up your hands. I see it. 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 Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you're lifting your hand, be bold right now. Be bold right now. Stand to your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have permission to pray for you? Do I have permission to pray for you, man? Do I have permission? I promise I won't embarrass you. Do I have permission? Wave your hand if I got permission to pray for you. Do I got permission to pray for you? Could you wave your hand at me if I have permission to pray for you? Would you just come up and pray with one of us right now? Come up. Come up. Come up right now. Please don't wait. Come out. Give my hand. Give my hand. Come on, give my hand right now. Come on, come on, come on. 
Come on up. Right here in us, you said who you believe in. You spoke it. We receive your kingdom. Come on, come on. We're just playing a for you. Look at all these people. Right here in us. They still coming. They still coming. They still coming. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Howdy, man. Can I shake your hand, man? Can I shake your hand, brother? Can I shake your hand, man? Welcome to that. Okay. Every person who's up here right now, you have somebody who's about to pray for you. But before they do, I'd like you to just look at me real quick because I want to just give you incredible things. There are two things I want to tell you. Number one, this is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. You'll never, ever re uh, regret this. There's no going back on this. What's about to happen is every sin that you know of, that you're guilty of, God knows it too. Do you know that he already knows it? He's not surprised. But he's about to get rid of it all. He's about to forgive you of everything. His blood's about to cleanse you and you're about to get a brand new slate. You see, with people, they say they forgive you, but they don't really forgive you. They keep reminding you of it. God will never remind you of any of these sins for the rest of your life. You will be the only one to remind him if you want to bring it up. God's going to forget it all. But here's the thing you got to do. This is the hardest. You're going to have to forgive yourself. God forgives you. It was as simple. He forgave you before you even did anything wrong. Think about that. God already paid for it before you ever entered the world. Before you had a chance to pray. Before you did anything right. God had already loved you. He formed you. He has a purpose for your life, man. And he forgives you from this moment. He's ready for your future. He doesn't want to talk about your past anymore. He wants to heal your past so that you can get up with your future. And that's going to happen in this moment. But you've got to release yourself. Because even though God forgives you, if you do not release yourself, and you're going to have to do this by faith, you're going to need God's help to do it. You got to release yourself so you can truly move on. I know some of y'all think that your sins are just like the worst ever, but God has seen it all. God knows it all. And his blood is good for you. So right now, take a moment, forgive yourself. Close your eyes, just forgive yourself. You know what it is. I need you to ask God for help and forgive yourself. Come on. I know this is difficult. See, Lord, I just give it to you. I trust that you're good enough for this right now. I trust that you're good enough. God is healing some of you right now in this moment. When you release forgiveness to yourself, God begins to heal you in ways you never knew. His love is coming into you right now. Here's the last thing. Everybody look up to me right now. Here's the last thing. This is not where it ends. You're going to say this prayer, but the Bible says true Christians, true people who become believers are people who confess with their mouth, believe in their heart, but then they change their ways. Meaning, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect today. It just means this. You got to let Jesus become the boss now. Yeah. Wherever you work, you're going to have to ask him about your job. You're going to have to ask him about the friends that are around you. He might want to switch some of them. You're going to have to ask him. You're going to have to give him ownership. True, true lordship, being a disciple, means Jesus is now the boss. I'm so proud of you. So here we go. Let's pray this prayer out loud. Everybody say it. Dear Lord Jesus, especially you. I receive you as my Savior. I receive you as my Lord. I know that you died on the cross. That you rose again on the third day. You did it for me. Thank you for becoming the curse. So I could be free today from death. Thank you for your blood so that I could be forgiven. I receive you now as my Lord and I receive you as my boss. Take me from this day forward. Show me what to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around. Turn around. Everybody get to your feet. Let's welcome new family members into the word of God. Turn around. Come on. Welcome them in.